So we come to the final and fourth question, and here it is for this week. It says, as a medical doctor, I find this course fascinating. I'd love you to address the role of deep anesthesia and the mind, and how the states of consciousness can be controlled by the means of chemicals and then reversed. Also, what has been learned from it when a state of almost brainstem death has been achieved? Um, so, thank you for that question. I think most uh, uh, learners will be uh, alarmed, uh, possibly, certainly surprised to learn how much we don't know about general anesthesia. Uh, there's a very great deal that we don't yet understand as to how general anesthetics work. Um, so this is a work in progress. Um, what I can say are, uh, is some general principles. One is that there's not only one type of general anesthesia. Uh, there are a range of different chemical substances used. They work in different ways. Um, and that applies not only to the development of anesthesia over the century past, a little more than a century past, um, but uh, also even in the present day, there's a variety of different substances that are used uh, for general anesthesia and they work in different ways. The second thing to say, and here's part of where the alarm comes from, and it perhaps is even compounded by this, which is that when I say that they work in different ways, partly what I'm referring to um, is that some of them have uh, analgesic properties. In other words, they uh, act on, on, on pain mechanisms, whereas others ha have uh, hypnotic properties. Uh, some uh, act on consciousness generating mechanisms. And a third set act on uh, memory mechanisms. And I don't mean that they work exclusively on the one or, or the other. But when we compare different um, uh, anesthetic substances, general anesthetic substances uh, in use today, we, we see that they vary one from the other in the extent to which they're operating or not operating on, for example, memory mechanisms versus consciousness mechanisms versus pain mechanisms. Um, the, 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 the third thing I'd like to say is that uh, although there is variability, one thing that characterizes general anesthetics more than people uh, might have assumed is that they don't act on one part of the brain. They act on nerve cells. Um, and so the effect is quite general. Um, and I know that it's partly contradicting what I said earlier, but it depends on what aspect of the cellular process uh, the mechanism uh, is operant as to which sorts of nerve cells are more or less susceptible or susceptible earlier at lower doses than others to the to the physiological effects that the that this anesthetic substance um, is uh, seeking. Um, so we're talking about, for example, um, uh, one very common um, uh, general anesthetic. It acts on GABA. A GABA, GABA receptors. GABA uh, is a inhibitory neurotransmitter. So it's just a matter of inhibiting, shutting down the brain, um, and shutting down the brain on all at all GABA uh, receptors. Uh, why I say that it's not totally the case that this is ubiquitous in all substances and that it affects all cells because cells, thank heavens, are different, uh, is that it obviously uh, cannot be true that all nervous activity is shut down. That would be death. Uh, you have their core brainstem structures, which monitor the state of the body and regulate the state of the body in terms of these certain parameters, which are absolutely essential to the preservation of life. And if those nuclei and their connections are um, are switched off, as it were, uh, then uh, your body would shut down. The brain regulates the body. So uh, those brainstem structures always have to be um, function, even under deep anesthesia. Now, the interesting thing is that it's also in the brainstem that those cells or those cell groups which are most essential for consciousness and for, and, and for pain perception uh, in the upper brainstem, uh, that's also where those cells are located. Uh, we have in the past focused much too much on cortex, um, and we've learned in recent years how much really it is the brainstem that's in charge. So it's a very delicate balance. Um, what these what these anesthetic substances are doing, which is why one really wants to know um, what's going on. It's, as I say, a little alarming. 
Now, a one recent tool that's been used, and I'll end with this, because as you can see, I can't answer the question because we simply don't have the knowledge. Uh, but one recent tool that's been used to try and explore where in the brain um, the different anesthetic substances are operating uh, is, of course, fMRI, functional magnetic resonance imaging, where you can see in the brain which areas um, are um, relatively metabolically active or, or deactivated um, under certain conditions. The problem with fMRI, and there's been quite a lot of studies recently in regard to where in the brain is the general anesthetic operating, let's look at the fMRI, it'll tell us. Well, not necessarily, because when you get down to the brain stem, which is relatively speaking very much smaller than the forebrain, um, and you look for signals uh, of uh, 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 relative degrees of metabolic activity, a tiny little nucleus in the upper uh, brain stem is not going to um, uh, register uh, in, in relative to a vast expanse of activation of cortex. That, that doesn't mean that the vast expanse of activation or deactivation of cortex is where the causal mechanism lies. That may be a knock-on effect of something happening in a very tiny um, brainstem nucleus which doesn't register um, uh, fairly uh, in the competition for signal um, in an fMRI scanner. So with that incomplete answer, remembering we don't know everything, um, let's end this session for this week and I hope you enjoy the course this week and I look forward to talking to you again in seven days time. Thanks. Bye-bye.